Now it's 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Hi, I'm Peter Weller, your host for tonight's program. When I think of the first moon landing, I think of Murica. Sadly, it's not that simple. Tonight, we'll take a closer look at the events leading up to Murica's first steps to the moon. From Kennedy to Johnson, from Soviet cosmonauts to American engineers, from dreadful disasters to amazing achievements, and most importantly, of course, from 1961 to 1969. You just saw President Kennedy propose the Apollo program before Congress. In the next year, he would make this proposal a declaration at Rice University before thousands of audience members. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Wowie! That was mighty inspirational, I must say. Now, some of you are wondering why the words coming out of my mouth are not matching my lips. No, this is not some stupid attempt at a voiceover done by an 11th grade student trying to create a history project. I assure you, I am Peter Weller. I am just a superhero who can do weird things, so deal with it. Moving on, it wasn't always a heated competition between the USSR and the USA. In fact, the two nations were at once in cooperation to land a man on the moon. These cooperation efforts soon ended when Kennedy was assassinated and Johnson took the Oval Office. Johnson attempted to reach out to Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev to continue lunar cooperation efforts, but things didn't go so well for... America. Let's take a listen at a phone call between the two leaders. Hello? Hello? Is this Mr. Khrushchev of the Soviet Union? Yes, who am I speaking with? Well, good afternoon, Mr. Khrushchev. I'm Lyndon B. Johnson of the United States of America, and I'm just I'm just here to talk to you about our continued efforts to land on the moon together. <sighs> Mr. I... Johnson, please, let me talk to you for a second right now. I okay. don't want to hear your voice again ever. I don't want to deal with the United States or your capitalist society. I just don't want to have anything to do with the United States because... Why would I help you guys when the USSR is the greatest nation in Are the world? Are you feeling all right, Mr. Khrushchev? Yeah, I'm feeling all right. I just can't stand the American culture, you know, with the Upton Sinclairs and the F. Scott Fitzgeralds. Why? All those are just nonsense. So, so fictional. I don't understand why you guys write that kind of stuff. That was 40 years ago. 40 years ago. We were just writing. That's literature. Well, mm. We're getting off topic. No, we're not. We're getting off top. I just, we're talking about the moon, our moon landing together. Am I correct in assuming that you're out of, out of the cooperation efforts? Um, I was never in any cooperation efforts, Mr. Johnson. But former President Kennedy made an agreement with you. Uh, he we made an agreement with me, and he ended up getting shot. What Mr. does that Proust tell job. you about the state of the United States? You are States? very disrespectful now. I'm sorry, but you are very disrespectful by calling me at 2 a.m. in the morning Mr. while I'm drinking my champagne and reading a book on my bed. Mr. Cruz, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. Maybe we'll discuss this a no, later time. No, we will never discuss this Wait. again. With both nations at a dead end in cooperation, the United States and the Soviet Union now travel down their own roads to find a way to land on the moon before the other nation. An amazing feat was achieved by the Soviets in 1962. Valentina Tereshkova, 
of the Soviet Union became the first woman ever to leave Earth. And it seemed to many Americans that this triumph was indeed the final nail in the coffin in terms of the space race. When Tereshkova returned to Earth, she was hailed by all in the Soviet Union. Even women in America, oh, I forgot, America, cheered as they saw Tereshkova's departure into space as a moment of sexual equality. When we come back, we'll take a look at some of the steps that the United States took to get ahead in the race with the Soviet Union, as well as some of the disasters they faced while doing so. And thanks to the help of my superpowers, I have skipped the commercials. You can thank me later. Americans, Americans I should say, were daunted yet optimistic after hearing President Kennedy's declaration of putting a man on the moon. In 1962, the American space program took its first steps toward the moon when Project Gemini, 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 Gemini was officially chartered by President Kennedy. Considered baby steps, Project Gemini established the goals of conducting longer space flights, finding a procedure to dock spacecraft with one another, perfecting the entry, the technique of re-entry into Earth's atmosphere, and adapting future astronauts of the Apollo program for the world of zero gravity. The aggregate efforts of all 12 Gemini missions conducted from 1964 to 1966 were not in vain. The program was a success and had accomplished all of its goals. America, America, was now in the home stretch of the race to the moon. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. Yearning for victory in the final frontier against the Soviets, the United States now turned its attention to the Apollo program. Although known for landing a man on the moon, Apollo had other goals as well. They included establishing superior technology to outdo the Soviets, to carry out a program of scientific exploration of the moon, and to develop man's capability to do work in the lunar environment. Camera man, don't do this to me. My head is cut off. You're a bad camera man. Please excuse me while I beat up my camera man. This will only take a short while. In the meantime, another host will step in to take my place. Enjoy! Apollo astronauts Roger Chaffee, Edward White, and Gus Grissom lose their lives in a tragic flash fire aboard their grounded space capsule. The tragedy occurred during a simulated countdown for the first flight of the Apollo program, whose goal is to put a man on the moon by 1970. Grissom and White were veterans of space flight. Chaffee, a rookie. During a drill similar to this, the entire three-man crew was engulfed by flames. A blue ribbon panel of space experts is investigating, aided by impounded NASA films and tape recordings. Grissom was one of the seven original astronauts. White was America's first spacewalker. Chaffee, never in space, had long experience as a jet test pilot. He was proud and happy that his first flight was to initiate the Apollo program. When the tragedy struck, one of the astronauts shouted, Fire in the spacecraft! In a few seconds, all three were victims of the swift inferno which left the capsule a blackened shell. One reporter said it looked like the inside of a furnace. Investigators theorized that perhaps a short circuit or electrical overload may have sparked the blaze. 27 would-be rescuers were all overcome by smoke and heat. Apollo astronauts Chaffee, White, and Grissom martyred heroes who gave their lives in total dedication to duty. Their memory will forever be honored. Sorry about that. We have a new cameraman now. Without further ado, let's move on. A similar fire took the life of Soviet cosmonaut Valentin Bondarenko 
in the March of 1961. In 1967, a parachute failure resulted in Vladimir Komarov's death. Although, the most eye-opening casualty was probably that of Yuri Gagarin. You may know him as the first man in space. He perished tragically in 1968 when he was on a training mission in a high-speed jet. These setbacks and others were not revealed to the public until the dissolution of the communist order. After the disaster of Apollo 1, the American space program was so angry that it decided not to name their next mission Apollo 2, but Apollo 7 for good luck. Apollo 7, 8, and 9 fixed the issues present with Apollo 1, and eventually Apollo 10 became the dress rehearsal for the paramount Apollo 11, as the crew of Apollo 10 descended just 8.4 nautical miles above the lunar surface before returning home. Victory never seemed so close. Apollo 11 was a truly monumental feat, a milestone in the human race, the beginning of a new era. Launched on July 16, 1969, Apollo 11 quickly became the talk of the town. Families tuned in on the television and radio, hoping to witness history being made. The crew of Apollo 11 consisted of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, all veterans of the Gemini program and experts in engineering their landing. With minor complications with the landing on the lunar surface, Armstrong, with his strong arms, successfully recalibrated his descent. Hours after landing, Armstrong exited the lunar module and spoke the iconic words of the decade. That moment on July 21st, 1969, at precisely 2.56 Greenwich Mean Time, was a page in the history books indeed. But did you hear what I heard? That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Don't man and mankind mean the same thing? Neil, I think you forgot to say, aw oh, man, instead of man. Gosh darn it, Neil! You had one job and you screwed it up! Just kidding. We love you, Neil. That's all the time we have for you, folks. I'm Peter Weller, and until next time, stay beautiful, America.